Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second session of the October 2020 Advocacy Sector Conversation Series. My name is Melissa Hayo, and I'm the coordinator of the Disability Advocacy Resource Unit. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we met and pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Once again, we are delivering these forums online in this new format due to the new normal we find ourselves in due to COVID-19. We are pleased to be able to still bring the advocacy sector conversation to you safely and online. Like many of you, we are still seeing some unexpected benefits in this type of program delivery. And we will be coming back to you all sometime soon to get your feedback on what you'd like and dislike about this format. So we can see to continually improve and provide the best experience we can for you. So please let us know what you think. You will note we have online interpreters today and we also have captioning that you can access. So if you go into the chat box, you will see a link that you can click to access the closed captioning in a separate browser. We encourage your active participation today. Please type your question in the Q&A box, not the chat box. And at the end of this session, I will be facilitating a Q&A session with our presenter. I hope you have settled in comfortably and ready for, ready for a great session ahead. You may already know about the updated changes to the Guardianship and Administration Act that came into effect on the 1st of March, 2020. The new act includes a presumption that a person has the capacity to make decisions unless evidence is provided otherwise, and recognises that a person also has decision-making capacity if they make, can make decisions with support. This is an important shift away from the best interest approach to one where it is acknowledged that decisions should reflect a person's will and preferences, unless it would cause serious harm to the person. Dr. Norman Chia is an advocate guardian at the Office of the Public Advocate, and he will step us through the newly created supported decision maker role under the Act. Please welcome Dr. Norman Chia. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for um, for asking me to present and also for attending this live webinar as well. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I will be going through this presentation, and because I can't actually see anyone, I don't really know who's participating. I don't know much about your individual backgrounds. Um, I'm going to have to go on the assumption that um, perhaps some of you um, aren't terribly familiar with guardianship or administration or with the work of uh, the Office of the Public Advocate. Um, so I'm going to go maybe just a little bit slower just to make sure that people uh, don't feel um, overwhelmed or they don't um, miss out on information because I presume that they already know about guardianship or the public advocate. Um, if you already are very familiar with um, our office and guardianship and administration, then I do apologize, but uh, I just wanna make sure that, um, that I don't skip anything um, that people don't already know. So, um, and being a guardian, um, I'm going to concentrate in this presentation mostly on the guardianship aspect of the new legislation. Um, I do have a couple of slides about administration, um, but uh, if you're seeking more detailed information, then um, State Trustees, as an example, um, is a possible source of information from its website, um, or I think you can call them vice as well. So without further ado, and because I'm just mindful of the time, I want to make sure that there's enough time for all the questions. I'm going to start with our presentation. As uh, Melissa did before as well, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm presenting to you uh, from the land of the um, uh, Indigenous participants and uh, I'd like to acknowledge Victoria's Aboriginal communities, 
a rich culture and I like to respects to elders past, present and emerging and also noting that um, sovereignty was never ceded. Firstly, just some, some quick information about the Office of the Picket, if you're not already familiar with it. Uh, a very brief um, explanation of our role is uh, to promote the human rights of persons over 18 uh, with a disability. And you will note that I've put a star next to the 18. Um, uh, disability under the Guardianship and Administration Act is defined as one of And if you're still with me, if I'm still recording, especially, <laughs> I'm going to just continue on with my presentation until I'm, uh, until someone confirms with me that um, the webinar. Well, everyone, 2020 strikes again. So we're having a few technical issues. We've asked the presenter to disconnect and reconnect again. So please bear with us. Stay on the line. We'll be back soon. Thank you.
we're back. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I um, I think I broke the computer. I broke the internet. So, um, uh, and I do apologize for this. So look, I mean, I, I'm just mindful that um, I think we've lost a bit of time now as well. So um, hopefully we'll get back on track and um, there won't be any problems with my connection. Um, if I do, I think I just need to disappear from the video and just talk, uh, which will hopefully stabilize things. But I'll have to just take a couple of slides back because I think I was uh, pressing the button, um, not knowing what was going on. So we've skipped a couple of slides and I'll just quickly go back. Um, okay, so we're back here and I might need to um, just speed things up a little bit with um, and make sure that I focus and pay more attention to the really important slides for you as well, okay? Um, so as I said before, there's a star over the 18 because the public advocate and guardianship and administration only apply to people who are legal adults, so they must be over 18. Um, that said, I, um, I read recently that um, our office, the public advocate, uh, recently advocated and apparently quite strongly um, for a young teenager and so we were involved in negotiations, I think at quite a fairly high level as well with the NDIA uh, and possibly I think DHHS. Um, and that was obviously for someone who was under 18 years of old, so um, uh, of age. So I've put an asterisk there to say that even though guardianship and administration only applies to legal adults, um, there seem to be exceptions and instances um, I will probably say not very often though, uh, where our office might still advocate for people under 18 as well. The, the core function of our office is to protect people with a disability from abuse, neglect and exploitation. So there are, there are various pieces of legislation which are relevant when one talks about guardianship or administration. And I'll just quickly go through these here. Um, I think all of this information will be kept and recorded on the, uh, the, the website so you can access everything together, including uh, not only this presentation, um, but also the, um, this webinar, this recorded webinar, hopefully without the interruptions as well. Um, the main piece of legislation is the Guardianship and Administration Act 2019. Uh, do bear in mind that um, the Guardianship and Administration Act, which I will just call GAA from now on because it's such a long, such a long title, um, was originally created in 1986. And so there are two versions of it which are still uh, in effect at the moment, um, but most applications for guardianship or administration now, because they're after the 1st of March, are all made under the, the new act from 2019. So the new act um, can enable guardianship order or an administration order to be made, but also something now called a supportive guardianship or a supportive administration. Order. I will talk further about those uh, in later slides. Um, there are usual um, provisions and clauses around special medical procedures, which are defined, as I've written there, in section 140 of the um, GAA 2019. A special medical procedure is something that it, no one um, other than VCAT can make a decision on. It is um, uh, defined as a medical procedure that is um, reasonably likely or has the intention of leading someone to become infertile, termination of pregnancy, um, transplant of tissue or an organ, um, or there are other specific medical treatments <coughs> procedures um, as defined um, in the Act. The Powers of Attorney Act is also something that's relevant to VCAT, um, which is the authority in the tribunal which makes guardianship orders. Um, it can make decisions around uh, an enduring power of attorney, whether it um, continues, whether it's suspended or revoked, um, and similarly decisions about supportive powers of attorney appointments as well. And lastly, when we talk about a person's lifestyle or personal decisions, uh, that can also encompass medical treatment that they receive uh, and 
All of those are defined and covered under the Medical Treatment Planning and Decisions Act from 2016, including such things as whether a person or how a person makes an advanced care directive, um, being either an instructional directive or a values directive, which helps tell people like a general practitioner or a doctor um, what that person might like or would have liked in terms of any medical treatment for them um, if and when they lose decision-making capacity and they can't make an informed decision or communicate that anymore. So as Melissa pointed out before, the GAA came into effect on the 1st of March this year. Um, guardianship orders beforehand, so if it was made before the 1st of March, are still, many of them are still in effect now, and I'm still guardian for a lot of people under the old act from 1986. Um, I need to make my decisions for those orders according to what I believe is in the person's best interests, what is least restrictive for them, and what tries to give effect to their express wish. Um, I've put stars next to the words least restrictive and express wish because those criteria, those um, factors which help me make a decision, um, they are qualified with words or phrases such as um, if possible or wherever possible, whereas best interests does not have any qualification. And we take that to mean that best interests is the one, the main or possibly the overriding factor which we need to consider when we make a decision for someone um, if the order was made before the 1st of March this year. All orders, be it guardianship or administration, made after the 1st of March have a significant shift in paradigm. As Melissa pointed out before, it's got a much larger human rights focus so it moves away from what's in the person's best interests or what we think is best for them in what is really quite a paternal, paternalistic view to um, what um, is the person's will and preferences and making that happen. So to su uh, support a decision making, um, they, they occur via appointments by VCAT, you can also have a supportive guardian or a supportive administrator. Uh, and the obligation now is to support the person to make his or her own decision. That's um, put in this diagram form um, from someone called Michelle Browning, who works heavily in supported decision making, that area. And what she's drawn here is um, uh, a contrast between the old Guardianship and Administration Act from 1986 with the new Guardianship and Administration Act. And you can see here, she's used the diagram. It's supposed to represent, I think, um, the Copernican system of the, the universe, where the old, if I could put it that way, the old model of thinking was that um, uh, the sun revolves around the earth, uh, and that is substituted decision-making, so the old Guardianship and Administration Act, whereas the new Guardianship and Administration Act has it uh, where we the earth revolves around the sun, and the sun is really kind of indicative and representative of the represented person. Um, so all the supports, practicable and appropriate supports, should be made available to the person to help him or her make a decision um, for themselves, really, rather than having someone step in and take place to make a decision for that person, which is the old model of thinking and the old style of guardianship and decision making. So the primary object of the, uh, the GAA 2019 is to help align guardianship legislation with the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities um, and to recognise the need to support people to make their own decisions and have a greater say and involvement in, in their lives. Um, when VCAT makes an order, if it's guardianship or administration, then the VCAT will obviously need to, and it can, 
set safeguards and limits on the powers, still to make sure that the guardianship order, for instance, isn't arbitrary or that it doesn't intrude or impinge on a person's human rights and freedoms too much. It needs to regularly review the order um, and it needs to, it can also provide guidance or advice to the guardian or the administrator if they're seeking some clarification or if they'd like some uh, a bit of direction about how they might wish to proceed. VCAT, importantly though, doesn't actually make decisions. Um, the, the main decision for VCAT is to um, determine whether a person needs someone to help make them uh, help make decisions for them. But VCAT itself doesn't make decisions and say, Mr. Brown, um, you will be under a guardianship order and we decide that you will live in ABC, for instance. VCAT's role is primarily to decide whether Mr. Brown needs someone, someone else, uh, to make that decision for him or to help support him to make that decision. Decision-making capacity is specifically defined in the GAA 2019 and where it says S5 in the um, subject, that means some um, subject, uh, section, pardon me, section five. Um, it's, the definition is now brought in alignment with um, the definition from the Medical Treatment Planning and Decisions Act and the Powers of Attorney Act, so they're all consistent now. Um, but basically decision-making capacity is the ability for a person to understand information, to be able to hold and retain that information to the extent necessary to make a decision, um, to use it, to synthesize it, to turn the information around, to be able to then arrive at a decision that the person can then communicate in their own way, whether it's by uh, verbally, um, by speech, by gesture, by writing it down, or by any other means as well. So an important feature of the new guardianship legislation is that a person is presumed to have decision-making capacity unless there is evidence to the contrary. Um, and a person is taken to understand the information relevant to the decision if the person can understand it um, in a way that is appropriate to the person's circumstances as well. Um, whether that means using modified language, visual aids, speech boards, pictures, um, or even little, uh, little models, for instance, to help give a, a concrete explanation of the information. This particular section here, section five, subsection four, um, talks more about um, how a person might um, help to determine whether someone has decision-making capacity. Um, and uh, it says here, regard must be had to the following. A person may have decision-making capacity in relation to some matters and not others. So people might have a good grasp of financial uh, information. Um, but they might not be able to understand complex um, healthcare information about medical procedures. Um, if a person doesn't have decision-making capacity in relation to one thing, it may be temporary as well. So it could be just a temporary loss because of a head trauma, but it might not, might not necessarily be long lasting or permanent. Um, it shouldn't be assumed that some person doesn't have decision-making capacity because they simply make what others might believed to be unwise or unreasonable decisions. Um, people make them commonly um, throughout the day or throughout the week as well, but it doesn't necessarily mean that a person has lost decision-making capacity in its entirety. Um, and importantly, a person has decision-making capacity in relation to a matter if it's possible for the person to make the decision with practicable and appropriate support and those words are highlighted because they're really the key things that we as guardians and, and also support people need to think about how, um, how they can provide that person with practicable and appropriate support and what kind of forms that support can take. Um, and in that sense, one needs to be quite creative and inventive and very flexible 
um, and perhaps you know bring new innovations in terms of how information can be conveyed to someone else. Um, so this this particular section is taken straight out of uh, the Guardianship and Administration Act, um, but it just gives some examples of how um, of, of practicable and appropriate support. So um, it doesn't necessarily have to be verbal information. It doesn't have to be limited to something that's written down. Um, as I said before, it can be the use of models and figurines to actually explain a situation. Um, it could be pictures. Um, it could be actually taking someone to, um, to see something in person as well, um, to see, for instance, um, a specialist disability accommodation house so that they can see, well, this is a type of house where you, know, you might be able to live or that might be available to you. Um, so decision-making capacity, I think, is relevant and important all the time. I think um, it's when VCAT thinks about whether someone needs a guardian or a supportive guardian. Um, it's also when I, as a guardian, when I'm making decisions for someone, um, how, how much do I need to be involved? Um, how much support do I need to give the person? Has the person already got all the information or enough information to be able to make a decision for themselves? So this section, section eight of the Guardianship and Administration Act is very important because it talks about how a guardian needs to approach, or an administrator as well, needs to approach their work and how they can fulfill and complete their duties for someone um, who's under a guardianship order. Um, some of this does repeat itself with some of the other uh, sections and the other legislation, but a person with a disability who requires support to make decisions should be provided with practicable and appropriate support to enable that person, as far as practicable in the circumstances, to make and participate in decisions affecting the person and to express the person's will and preferences and to develop the person's decision-making capacity. Um, during this presentation, by the way, sorry, if I, if I refer to a guardian, um, then I will use that term interchangeably with an administrator as well, okay? Um, it's just a bit easier for me to, to say guardian rather than guardian and or administrator. Um, further to uh, the previous slide, it's very important, subsection B, the will and preferences of a person with a disability should direct, as far as practicable, decisions made for that person. What that basically means is um, if I am guardian for a person and he is saying he wants X, Y, Z, then I need to pursue the possibility of X, Y, Z, not A, B, C, not DEF, not something else, with exception, in the first instance, I need to do X, Y, Z, because that is the person's will and preference, as long as I'm comfortable and confident that there is a genuine reflection of what that person really wants. So just briefly, um, what is a guardian? A guardian is someone who's appointed by VCAT uh, to make decisions about a person's personal matters, what we used to call lifestyle issues. Um, most of that slide is blank. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you some things that a guardian is not. Um, and I say this only because a lot of people, um, whether it's family members or people who work within the disability sector, they often sometimes, unfortunately, have um, a bit of a misconstrued idea or understanding of what a guardian does. Um, a guardian is not going to be the savior or the magical cure or the panacea for all of the issues or any problems. The role of the guardian traditionally was a substituted decision maker. The role of the guardian now under the legislation is a supported decision maker. 
but the, the common element is to make decisions. It's not to case manage. It's not to find supports. It's not to drive the person around, take them shopping, take them out into the community. Um, it's not to assist them in interviews. Um, the, the, the function, the principal function is to make decisions. My title though, as you might have seen from the, the start of the presentation, is not just guardian, but advocate guardian. And so there is an advocacy component to my role. Um, and that more accurately encompasses things like perhaps, you know, attending NDIS planning meetings, um, helping to find supports if there is no one else available um, to do so, such as family members, friends, a case manager or a social worker. But principal, uh, the principal function of a guardian is to make decisions. Similarly, the principal role of an administrator is to make decisions about a person's finances or their legal affairs. And I've, I've got various examples of um, what uh, decisions that can be. So before VCAT makes um, a guardianship appointment or an administration for anyone, it needs to be satisfied of all of these criteria. So first of all, the person has to have a disability in the meaning of the act. And that disability must uh, mean that the person doesn't have decision-making capacity about either their personal matters, their lifestyle, or their financial matters. Secondly, the person actually needs to have, uh, needs um, a guardian uh, or an administrator. Just because someone has a disability or they lack decision-making capacity, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a decision that needs to be made if things are going very well and there's no need to change something or add or remove something, then I don't see why the person would need a supported decision maker to help them make a decision. They should be able to do that by themselves without being under a legal order. And thirdly, the VCAT needs to also be satisfied that the order will promote the person's personal and social well-being. Examples of personal matters. So as a guardian, some things uh, which I can help to make decisions around where a person lives, what services they can use, and that can include how they access the NDIS or how they use their plan, who gets to see a represented person or who the represented person can actually see as well. Um, what kind of employment training they do, uh, what medical treatment they receive. And I've specifically highlighted here under section 40, the power to bring and defend legal action, or legal proceedings on behalf of the person as well. I've specifically mentioned that because that is new. That wasn't included in the, the old Guardianship and Administration Act. Um, the last thing that I've mentioned there is daily living issues, such as a person's diet or dress. In all my time as a guardian, and even though the new Guardianship and Administration Act is still quite relatively young, I've never seen those particular issues included in a guardianship order where um, a guardian is has the authority to support a person to make decisions about how they dress or what they eat. I think that reflects that the VCAT is very mindful that it is a very prohibitive and very restrictive order to include that. Um, and I think that's why I've never seen it. Uh, none of my colleagues, uh, to the best of my knowledge, has ever seen that included in an authority to date. Um, and I, I would hope that it would be a redundant authority and never really needed. Examples of financial matters. Well, it's about paying a person's bills um, direct debits, making sure their rent is paid on time, making sure that the person has access to money and funds when they need it for their own personal spend, to go shopping, to buy groceries, to buy clothes, to buy things that they like as well, but to do so in a prudent manner, to make sure that the person isn't going to be destitute or going to run out of money, but that they have some financial security for the future as well. 
It can also include selling a person's home if, for instance, um, the person enters residential aged care and needs to be able to fund that through uh, residential accommodation deposit. This is just some information about the application process. You'll note that um, there is one pathway which um, can lead you to my office, the public advocate, to get advice. Um, if you're ever in doubt and you're involved in potentially submitting an application to VCAT, um, I'd always recommend that you contact our office, the um, our office's advice service, to talk about the application, why it's needed, and whether there are any less restrictive alternatives that you can consider. If and when an application is made to VCAT, it doesn't necessarily mean that an order will be made. Um, it could be that VCAT refers the matter to our office for an investigation where one of uh, someone from the dedicated investigations team will look more closely into the matter and answer specific questions such as, does the person really need a guardian or an administrator or uh, does it have to be um, uh, an external office or could it perhaps be a family member or a friend? Guardianship orders um, normally last for one year. There are exceptions to that. There are short term orders, which are less, less than a year, perhaps six months. Um, there are some instances where guardianship orders are made for three years uh, because the tribunal, the VCAT wishes to see some as much as possible, some stability in the person's um, life uh, and in their in their day to day orders and in their affairs. They're more the exception than the rule. Administration orders normally are made for three years, but there are also exceptions where there, there can be shorter administration orders as well. I haven't seen any supportive guardianship or administration orders to date, so I'm afraid I don't have any information about how long they last. Um, at any time, anyone, including a guardian or an administrator, can uh, go back to VCAT early to seek reassessment of the order if they don't believe it's still needed anymore or if they don't want it as well. VCAT will make the decision then about whether the order is cancelled or whether it continues. So this is um, uh, section nine. Um, this talks further about the decision making principles and how I, for instance, as a guardian, need to make decisions. And this, uh, along with section eight, is one of the key um, parts of this new legislation. So the person whom I'm, um, for whom I'm guardian, has to be given all practicable and appropriate. Pardon me. Um, I should give all pro uh, practicable and appropriate effect to the represented person's will and preferences. Now that's assuming that I know what the person's will and preferences are, and it's incumbent on me as the guardian to make sure that I spend enough time with the person to fully and truly understand what the person's will and preferences are. Um, if I'm unable to actually f determine with confidence uh, the person's will and preferences, um, I need to then to see if I can make a decision that I think most closely matches that person's will and preferences. And that would be based on all information that I receive from, from the person themselves, but from any family members, any friends, any services, professional services that are involved with them. And if it means I need to go uh, and do a lot of investigative work to really get to know the person and look into their background, then that is what is required from me in order to be able to try to understand and, and fully appreciate their will and preferences so that I can then make a decision about how to support them best. If it turns out that after all of that, I can't actually understand or ascertain the, the person's will and preferences, then I can make a decision that I think um, promotes their personal and social well-being, And that basically means um, what is best for them and what is going to protect them and ensure that they're not uh, subject to further um, any distress, any harm um, or any suffering. One thing that's important is that I need to also recognize if a person has a companion animal uh, under subsection D, 
this is new that hasn't been included in previous legislation and it's it's not a trivial matter it's really important to to see whether um, i can still maintain the relationship between the person and their companion animal uh, as much as possible now the, i did mention before that um there is an exception when i don't have to follow the person's will and preferences and i don't have to do what they are wanting and that is if um if to do so would result in harm or serious harm to that person um, that is the only instance and the only time when i can justifiably override a person's will and preferences Uh, will and preferences isn't defined, um, so it's it's partially subjective. Um, one generally thinks of a person's will as something as that the person wants, whereas preferences um, might be more something that a person tends to like something over something else. Um, uh, but it's, it's un, rather unhelpfully not defined in legislation, so it really is up to the um, the individual person, the guardian assisting to try to understand what is the person's will and what is the person's preferences as well. They can change over time and depending on the person's individual circumstances um, and depending on the information that they have as well, they might be able to process that and say, well, given, given the new information that you've, that is available to me, my will is no longer to do this, but to do something else instead. Um, will and preferences is sometimes a bit difficult to ascertain when the person fluctuates in their view. Um, the guardian will need to, to be particularly creative and flexible and inventive to see, um, to try to ascertain uh, and establish what seems to be the more likely or reasonable um, reflection of the person's will and preferences. You know, do I need to speak to a certain person or communicate with someone at different times of the day, in a different setting, um, um, in a different manner. Uh, these are some of the things that we need to consider as guardians when we're trying to ascertain the person's will and preferences. I'm just mindful of the time because we had the technical difficulties before, but um, I think we if uh, we might be able to go over 12, but um, if we need to hurry up along so we get everyone's questions, and I'm happy to do that as well. So if I do go through the slides a little bit quicker than normal, I'm sorry about that. Um, again, it was my fault with the, um, I think the technical difficulties as well. So um, the uh, a represented person's personal and social well-being is promoted by just recognizing the inherent dignity of the person, respecting their individuality, um, having regard to their existing supportive relationships, uh, religion, values, and cultural and linguistic environment as well. Serious harm is, um, like will and preferences, not defined in the legislation. So um, it is a subjective assessment and analysis by the person. What I consider to be serious harm for a person might not necessarily be what my colleagues think to be serious harm. So there are different thresholds there. Um, but the, the thrust of this provision is to make sure that the person is not going to be unnecessarily and continually exposed to any kind of danger or risk to themselves. Um, we need to take into account um, the fact that, you know, serious harm could be moving someone, for instance, out of their home um, that is squalid, hoarded with wet and dry material um, and unhygienic. Um, but um, you know, moving them to a, a new residence um, where they're disoriented, where they're likely to be aggressive, um, uh, where they're going to be plainly very unhappy and very upset, that can also represent serious harm to the person as well. So um, we need to um, carefully balance um, uh, the risks to the person depending on their situation and their circumstances. A supportive guardian is someone who can help to support a person to make decisions as long as the person agrees to it. So the first point there is that the person must consent to VCAT making the order. 
And that means that the person has to understand what a supportive guardian or a supportive administrator does as well. There are limits on what a supportive guardian or administrator can do. They're outlined here. They have the power to access, collect or obtain information or help the supported person to get that information. They can help, they have the power to communicate certain information about the supported person, uh, to communicate decisions that are made by the supported person or to help the supported person to communicate the decisions themselves and to take any reasonable action or do anything that is reasonably necessary to give effect to, um, oh, that should be to certain decisions, pardon me. Uh, there's a typo there. Um, they don't have the power to actually make the decision or override the person's will and preferences. And that is the key difference between a guardian or and a supportive guardian. Um, just like with a guardian, a supportive guardian has to act diligently and honestly in good faith you know, competently as well by exercising reasonable skill and care, not try to exploit the position um, to the detriment of the supported person and not act if there's a conflict of interest as well. They also have to discuss anything relating to a supported decision with the person in a way that is appropriate uh, to the supported person's needs. Um, they obviously goes without saying, they shouldn't assist the person to conduct any illegal activity and they can't, um, or they're not supposed to coerce, intimidate, or somehow influence the supported person into one particular course of action over another. So with that said, um, the final slide here gives an indication about some, what kind of resources are available on our website. I did refer before to our officer's advice service. Um, I'm sometimes on the advice service, so the guardians sometimes help to take calls and give advice. It's an invaluable service if you're ever in doubt or just seeking information or some clarification about the legislation or about whether a guardian or an administrator is needed. And you'll find on our website, there are lots of other online resources, which I, I think will be very helpful to you as well. Um, I'm sorry if I've waffled on or if I've skipped through some slides very quickly, but I'm just mindful that some, some people might need to go at 12 um, and there might be lots of questions. So I'm happy to, to answer anyone's questions right now. Thank you very much, Norman. That was really useful. I think we, before we go to questions, the first thing I would like to highlight is that the recording from this session and the slides will be available on the Darwin website after this session. So you all can look back on this later. So we will go to questions and answers now. We got a lot of questions and I will try my best to get through some of them, but we're going to run a little bit over and we won't get through all of them. So what I might do is collate all the questions and go back to you at a later date, Norman, if you could help me answer them and we can collate yeah. some of the answers on our resource page later. So we'll get through some that we can, we'll go through some now and we'll try to finish on time. So the first question is, does a person who has a supported decision-making order qualify them to uh, be a plan nominee under the NDIS? Okay, um, um, not necessarily. Okay, so um, um, let's say as a guardian, uh, I think the NDIA regards guardians um, different to a plan nominee. There is two separate categories there. Um, and so I'm guardian for a person who, um, whose mother is still her plan nominee as well. So she has both a plan nominee and a guardian. Um, I, I think the NDIS, if there is no plan nominee, such as a family member or a trusted friend, the NDIA will prefer that the guardian be considered or take the role of a plan nominee, but it's not to automatically say that um, the person will be the plan nominee. And I think that I think the person themselves should still have some, some say uh, and role in saying whether they want someone to be a plan nominee or not. Thank you. Can I have the next question, please? I the existing orders under the 1986 Act need to be updated. Will they be transitioned to the new Act? Yes, they definitely will. So, um, uh, so I'm still guardian for lots of people under the 1986 Act. When the when the order is reassessed. And if a new order is made, 
um, it will be made then under the new Act, according to the 2019 Act. This one's a long one. There are a lot of people living in supported accommodation housing and do not have planned nominees. Some of these people have significant and complex disability. How do these people access appropriate decision-making support when in these situations to ensure that decisions are presented? Um, that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, I think um, uh, if and wherever possible, if they can be assisted by an individual advocacy service, valid, for instance, or scope, um, there are lots of others. Um, that might be perhaps one of the most effective ways. Um, sometimes that simply isn't possible, and sometimes there aren't anyone else who can be effectively fulfil the role of the plan nominee. Um, I'm, I'm reluctant to say, um, even though we are commonly, um, guardians I don't think are necessarily the, the solution there, because when you think about it, um, you need to go through the process of a guardianship application, it has to go to a hearing, that can take time. If an, uh, a guardianship order is made, it can still take time for a guardian to be appointed. Um, let's say it's me. Um, it takes time for me to get to know the person then and understand what they want, their needs are, and then to be able to fairly and accurately, but effectively as well, put them forwards to the NDIA in a planning meeting as well. That that might be disadvantageous because it might take you know three four, five months, um, in which time the person will you know, fall behind. Um, I'm a, I don't know whether I can answer that, that question, you know, to anyone's satisfaction. Um, there simply might just be a, a, a dearth of, um, uh, of suitable workers and, and support people to, to help people access the NDIS and, and, and really get their views and their needs across to, to meet all their needs. Thank you. I think we'll go one more question and then we'll wrap up. Traditionally, independent advocacy services have referred issues to OPA as a higher authority with mandated power to protect and represent a person with a disability. Under the new Act, is this still the case? Um, I don't think the new Act really talks much about advocacy. Um, uh, but it, it certainly, I mean, from our officer's point of view, we, we still accept um, referrals directly from advocacy services for with direct requests for advocacy. Um, sometimes they are put through to our office via VCAT. Um, sometimes they can be made directly to our office just as normal procedure as well. But the new Act doesn't prohibit or stop that from happening. Um, so that hasn't really changed. Right. Well, I think that's all we've got time for today. We've got a list of other questions that I would love to talk to you about line and be able to publish with our resources as well. So thank you very much, Norman, for your time and sharing your expertise today with us all. We truly do look forward to working with you and OPA more closely as a sector as time goes on to get the best outcomes poss possible for people with disabilities and to make sure that they are supported to make decisions as independently as possible. Yes, no worries. Thank you very much for having me today and um, I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. So everybody, we've come to a close to the second session of an exciting series this week. I would like to thank the Office of the Public Advocate and Dr Norman Chia for his time to bring this presentation to you today and for the great work that's happening in this space. Thank you to the Iceland interpreters and captioners for their hard work today. Thank you to Show Division for bringing this production to you today. Please stay safe, wear your mask. Wash those hands and stay home. See you next time.